see the direction in which Spanish Jewry was uh, headed. I tried to show you last time that uh, fundamentally speaking, there were two powerful forces uh, that existed in Spain sort of in opposition to each other as far as what the situation of the Jews should be. On the one hand, you had the very powerful Roman Catholic Church who uh, for, contained significant elements that one of the Jews uh, gone in one way or another. And then on the other side of the equation, sort of balancing it out, without this balance, the Jews wouldn't have been there one day, were the, uh, the crown, the king, the secular state, the kings, the queens, the nobles, the people who uh, found the Jews a plus for their own personal economy. And so that's what it was. Uh, you know, if it was strictly a matter of faith, then you were uh, going to find a very militant Roman Catholicism in uh, Spain, that's an understatement. Uh, not surprising considering the fact that there are hundreds of years, as I said before, constantly at war with the infidels, uh, rather successfully. Uh, here's the map that we're looking at in the entire uh, period of tonight. Second, there you go. That's Spain as existed at that time. So you see there is no such thing as Spain. But of course, you know what I mean, the Spanish Peninsula, in which those of you who are good in uh, geography will recognize Portugal is still there, but that's the only other country that's still there. The rest of these eventually combined into what you and I call today Spain. But at that time, this was not the case. At that time, the, as you see, the largest kingdom was called the Kingdom of Castile. The smaller but also very large kingdom was called the Kingdom of Aragon. This little one up here is called the Kingdom of Navarre. These are the three Christian kingdoms that eventually combined into Spain. Right? And uh, even today, not that you should need to know this, there's a lot of tension in Spain between the people in the Catalan areas, which are over here, and the others, and uh, General Franco used to suppress them, and the, some of us old enough will remember, actually it's still going on now, you have the Basque terrorists up there in Navarre. Now this is why, th this word all goes back to. And of course this little piece over here was still under the Muslims. This is the Kingdom of Granada, which they held on to in 1492. This is the reality of, the, of what we're going to be talking about uh, tonight and uh, next week. Uh, this is what we mean the history of the Jews in Christian Spain because they were united in about 1492. Well then the Jews are kicked out. So in other words when you see the regular map of Spain there are no more Jews left. So if we're talking about the Jews in Spain we really mean the Jews of primarily Castile and Aragon and to some limited degree here and here. All right. Now uh, as I said the kings the, even the uh, official bishops and the cardinals of the church and the nobles, these are people who are well-to-do. Well-to-do means you have business, you have investments, uh, you're interested in your bottom line, that's where the Jews come in. That's, uh, that, that's what, uh, they didn't deny this. I'm talking about a period when political correctness, as we understand it, didn't even exist as a concept. On the contrary, in the Middle Ages, it was taken for granted that Jews have no business whatsoever being in a strange land, being in space, not their country, go back to Israel. If they are here, they're here under one reason alone. Right. This is what the charters said. The um, point is that uh, all the people who were the haves, people in power, therefore sort of had a vested interest in having the Jews uh, there to some degree. You know, maybe not too many Jews, maybe not too uh, you know, uh, uppity and all that, but the bottom line is the Jews served a purpose in their economy. By con I repeat, this included the big shots in the Roman Catholic Church as well. And so the Jews were able to handle, to do business with the uh, local monasteries and certainly the people who were high up in the church, uh, who became a bishop or an archbishop or a cardinal in the Middle Ages, a nobleman. You understand? I mean, that's how it works. And uh, therefore, the, the, the bishop might not own land, uh, and he might, uh, but his brother and sister and others will. And so the Jew is the guy who's you know, handling his investments for the brother, the sister, the uncle, and the cousin. So who is it that it's against the Jews? And the answer is everybody else. They, have no, they, they, they don't see themselves as, as gaining anything from the presence of the Jews. Uh, perhaps the opposite. If you're a, a middle class fellow, lower middle class particularly, uh, certainly if you're uh, a poorer type, uh, what do you get out of the Jews? Uh, the opposite. You know, I'm sure they said in Spain, in 1300, the Jews in all the gas stations, all the 7-Elevens, 
-hmm. You understand? That's exact. This is really what happened. That's, I'm using a modern American equivalent. What do I gain out of it? The opposite. You know, all the laundries. You know, everything you do is a, is a Jew. Uh, you know, if they weren't here, I'd have it. I'm not saying that's really what it was, but th this is how they thought. And so if you understand these simple terms, you, you, you understand what I'm talking about. Consequently, uh, when, people would, when people who were not bishops of the church, but uh, smaller fry, but very important priests and preachers would uh, make speeches and carry on against a big audience. And that's exactly what they would say. They would say, you know, look at the 7-Elevens and look at the uh, laundries and, uh, you know, uh, who owns, I don't know, uh, wh wh whatever chain you want, and uh, it's the Jews. And of course, you don't have to put it in naked economic self-interest. You can also throw in, and, and why not, the fact that, uh, strictly speaking, the presence of Jews in a Catholic country is a blasphemy. I mean, if the last people that we should be allowed here would be the Jews who did this, that, and the other to our Lord. And so it was very easy to heat up the population. And the story of what happens to the Jews in the second half of the 1300s and the first of the 1400s is the story of the Father Coughlin's. The, as I put it last week, people like uh, the Rush Limbaugh's and you know, the Al Sharpton's, even though I really don't want to, I'm just using Rush Limbaugh as an example. I'm like, he's, he's not like that at all. But they had public speakers with a tremendous audience, and therefore they have a big kayak. And there was, you'll see there's a succession of these guys all throughout the second half and particularly the late 1300s and the early 1400s. And they don't go away. And, uh, and they make things worse and worse. And unfortunately, uh, they're, they're, they're getting more successful all the time. And in 1391, it reached a, a boiling point. Let me give you the bare facts as laid out by Cecil Roth. Uh, in, 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 in a very uh, simple uh, fashion, and then uh, we'll talk about it. Here we go. Um, in October of 1390, okay, uh, at this time, there were uh, constant civil wars in Castellan and Aragon. And uh, one of the big problems that happened was that in this period, um, there were no good, strong kings. The Jews needed a king who was a king, or a queen who was a queen, who will tolerate no monkey business, who will be uh, on the ball to suppress any kind of uh, outbreaks, what we would call today rioting and uh, disorder in the public. And the Jews, as a minority and an exposed minority, are particularly interested in a strong government of law and order. This usually was the case in the Middle Ages. After all, there was no such thing as liberalism. On the other hand, when a king died and there was a young one left over and there's a regency, or if you simply had a loser on the throne, um, then uh, just like students can intuit a stronger teacher and a weaker one, the people can intuit a stronger king and a weaker one. They can tell. Uh, now they'll be able to get away with things that they couldn't get away with before. And uh, the story in Spain, without going through all the gory details, is that in the late 1300s, this happened in both Castile and Aragon, yet either an interregnum or, more exactly, the old king died and the new king was very young and there was a regency run by the queen and others, or uh, there was a profound civil war and there was nobody in charge. Um, I would even throw in one more factor before I proceed, uh, and that's the Pope. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon in the history of the Jews in Spain. Um, obviously, Europe is Roman Catholic completely. Anybody who in the Middle Ages wanted to deviate at all from formal Roman Catholicism was burned at the stake. It didn't happen. You know, there, there were wars in which, as they call it, heresies were suppressed. In the Albigensian Wars, I think a million people were killed in southern France. Uh, so, you know, they didn't fool around on that. Uh, but, uh, at the same time, the, the Catholic Church is a gigantic organization with the Pope formally at the top, but it's also quite decentralized. It's a marvelous, from the organizational point of view, it's quite remarkable. It's been around for thousands of years, and it's functioned very successfully because it's always managed, or very often it's managed, to maintain the right kind of 
centralization and decentralization at the same time. Um, the Jews, historically, when they're in trouble somewhere in the Catholic countries, uh, did a number of things. They would go to the local guys and try to buy them off, because what other weapons did the Jews have? None. And they would go to the Pope and try to buy his support, because they have no other weapons. The Popes usually uh, gave the Jews what they want, for good money, of course, and things like that. Well, uh, but, when, but, but they did. And I'll just give you one example of many, which may surprise you. All the popes, without exception, declared that the blood libel is not true. Interesting. Right? Yes. Uh, whenever there was, and this is the period when it happened in the 11, 12, 13, 1400, that's when it was uh, vicious. That's when Jews were just attacked by mobs and forced to confess and burned the stake and all this sort of thing in England and all, Germany, all over the place. Uh, but nevertheless, hello, Tavarhu. The popes, when they were approached, and as I say before, when they were, uh, you know, uh, paid and things like this, but only paid to do the right thing, uh, they issued uh, the, the declaration that it's not true. Uh, there were occasions where the popes, in order to make sure, called in a bunch of Jewish mishamadim, Jews who had converted to Christianity, and said, y you tell me what's the bottom line, give me the inner secrets of the circle, do you guys kill children for the matzah and all the rest? And they would say, no, I mean, the Jewish religion is a naughty, retarded kind of thing, it's got all this, bad. that's why we switched from Jewish to Krishna, but that's not, but, but that we don't do. It's interesting that that was uh, the case. Right? So, Pope was someone you could appeal to, uh, possibly. In the 1300s, the uh, p papacy fell apart for 100 years. Um, this is the history of the Catholic Church. The Pope got into argument with King Philip IV of France in 1305, and he arrested the Pope, and then uh, the Pope died right after he was arrested, and then they put the other Popes not in, they took him out of Rome and they, and they imprisoned him and they held the popes up there in France, in Avignon. So if you go there today, it's one of the things they take tourists to see where the popes lived in what they called the Babylonian captivity in, in, in Avignon. And uh, the point is you ended up having two, three, four popes at the same time and the papacy as an institution uh, kind of fell apart. That will play an important part in our story. When the riots hit in, in Spain, there's nobody to appeal to in Rome. Nobody's at home. Now, specifically, there was a Jewish uh, almost sarif, a big shot at court, named Yosef Pichon, and uh, you don't rise to these positions by being a nice guy necessarily, you rise by being tough. I'm going to ask you a question. What does it take like to, to survive in a renaissance or medieval court? Everybody's out to get everybody. You, know. you, can, you don't drink a lechaim with anybody when you pour it out. So the, the, uh, this is the great age of Borgias, you know. So uh, what does it be, to be a rough, tough guy? Well, he, he got to rise to the top of the greasy pole, and other Jews uh, didn't like him, and it's not clear what happened, but he was accused of being a Malshin. And the end of the story is uh, the Jews uh, arrested him and, and uh, executed him, and they told the king of Castile that uh, you know, they have a bad guy who's an informant in the community, and as I told you last week, in pursuance of the normal policy, the kings actually backed the uh, execution of these type of people provided they got their estate. But when the king found out it was somebody that he liked, he got really angry. And you have a situation where there's a weak king who's angry the Jews or, or uh, miffed at them. And this uh, spells out to the public. And this Yosef Bichon lived in Seville or was originally from Seville, and therefore the city of Seville is seething. At that time, uh, there happened to be a particularly uh, eloquent uh, Father Coughlin named Ferrant Martinez. And he. Uh, started making particularly vociferous speeches against the Jews. Uh, they had recently built a big synagogue, and that's all you needed to take everybody off. And uh, one thing led to the other, and in March of 1391, violence and gigantic riots break out. In October 1390, King John I of Castile died, being succeeded by his infant son, Henry, Henry III. During the minority, when the, kid, when the king was young, great authority was enjoyed by the queen mother, Leonora, whose father, Confessor Fernand Martinez, the Archdeacon of Echicha, immediately became a power in the state. So this guy, Father Coughlin, the Rosh Limbaugh guy, was no longer simply a powerful radio personality, as we would say today, but became a, a, a Secretary of State, a Secretary of Treasury, and he became a, a very important figure at court. 
The latter was a man of little learning, but noteworthy for his indomitable spirit and a sworn enemy of the Jews. For the past twelve years he had been inveighing against them from the pulpit and endeavoring to procure their expulsion from the various towns of Castile. Injunctions from the king and from the pope had been ineffectual to silence him. The Jews went over his head. Jews went to the king. Jews went to the pope. They issued orders for him to shut up with these incendiary speeches. He didn't listen. See, he knew. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? If they arrest him, that will really make him a hero. He asserted loudly that the 23 synagogues in, in the Diocese of Seville had been constructed in defiance of the laws, and these shoals should be torn down. So he focused on something very specific. Now with the death of the king, and simultaneously with the archbishop, who had been able to check his activity to some extent, this guy, Ferran Martinez, was freed from all restraint and procured by letters to the local clergy the partial destruction of some of the unauthorized synagogues. Half-hearted instructions addressed in him from the court to desist and make good the damage done only served to enlist the sympathy of the populace to his side. You know, you can't, you can't play games with the successful demagogues. The advent of Lent, with its reminders of the passion, we all remember the, what's the, what's the guy who made the movie a couple years ago? You know, you, you, right, Mel Gibson. So they, 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 in Spain, you can just imagine in the 1300s what the passion looked like, served as the pretext for a fresh series of inflammatory sermons, which keyed the popular passions to the highest pitch. So in other words, it's Easter season in Spain, uh, they reenact all the stuff. You know, it's, uh, I won't go into that, but if you know anything about the Spanish culture, I mean, they still nail people to the cross till today. I think it's considered a great honor and so forth. On Ash Wednesday, which is March 15, 1391, a turbulent crowd broke into the Jewish quarter, the Jewish neighborhood of Seville, which was in imminent danger of sack. The civic authorities had a couple of the ringleaders seized and whipped. Right? Now, Pedro had a cruel burned them, but uh, toasted him. He had him whipped. But this served only to exasperate the feelings of the rest of the crowd. You see? You can just see it. After some further disturbances, order was outwardly restored, but the spirit of unrest still simmered, while Martinez continued his unbridled speeches from the pulpit. At length, on June 9, 1391, the mob could no longer be restrained. An orgy of carnage raged in the city. The Jewish quarter was pitilessly sacked. 4,000 people, men, women, and children were killed, while those who did not succeed in making good their escape were only able to save their lives only by accepting baptism. And so now we begin something we're going to see, and I'm going to read about before, the major consequence of 1391, which is the conversion under the direct mob violence of huge numbers of Jews. The fury spread throughout that summer and autumn throughout the whole of the peninsula, from the Pyrenees to Gibraltar, notice, from, from the top to the bottom, right, all over the country. Uh, at Eifian and Carmona, the whole Jewish community was exterminated. A quarter of the entire Jewish neighborhood was uh, reduced to ashes. Toledo was the scene of a frightful massacre on Chivas and Batanos. Similar outbreaks took place in 70 other cities in Castile. In Aragon, the other kingdom, despite the severe me measures taken by the king to suppress the disorder, didn't matter. The example was followed. And so we see over here a spontaneous uprising from the Hamon Am, from the people, from the populace, against the wishes of the police, against the wishes of the um, kings and the, even the, the bishops, I might say, and others. But what are you going to do? We all know, you, unless you're Stalin, you can't shoot the whole crowd. You know, if you have a few people, or you seize the ringleaders, and that'll do the trick, that's one thing. But what do you do when the whole city comes and attacks? They were smart. Right? They can't expel the whole school. If you have three students, it's one thing. If the whole school did it, what are you going to do? This was the problem. Um, and so despite the efforts of the king, in the kingdom of Valencia, uh, in the capital city of which the lead had been given on July 9th by a crowd of hysterical boys, so you just see a bunch of young kids, Catholic kids, say, let's go kill the Jews and all that, and they whip it up. Not a single professing Jew was left alive. No, he had to convert or else he were killed. At Barcelona, Barcelona was the capital of Aragon, the center of the Rajbo, the Rand, the leading center of Yiddishkeit in the whole of Spain, Torah Yiddishkeit, in these areas, in spite of the protection of the authorities, the whole community was wiped out. From Catalonia, the frenzy spread to the Balearic Islands, where on August the 2nd, an exterminatory massacre took place at Palma. And there's the Balearic Islands over there, where the Tash base lived. Famous over there. Today, these are all, uh, see, I'm always of two minds. You must have just been proposed, as I said before, you should make a trip to Spain. And, uh, and it is very interesting to go on a Jewish historical trip to Spain. But I can't get really wild about going, you know, to the coast of the Seoul and to the, these are supposed to be really hot spots now among the uh, uh, tourists uh, to go into the Balearic Islands. The place is dripping with Jewish blood. So there's what to see, but it, you, you feel funny. 
Okay. Anyway, uh, from Catalonia, the frenzy spread to Balearic Islands, and the total number of victims was said to amount to 50,000 people killed. There were some important communities like Barcelona, which had been maintained an unbroken existence from the 700s now, which were never again to be established. Outbreaks were avoided only in Granada and in Portugal. Uh, in Aragon, those responsible were punished, though in most cases not very severely. In Castile, however, the passivity of the authorities showed that they virtually condoned the outrages which had been uh, committed. Now, um, so those are the basic uh, facts over there. But the other side of the coin is that 50,000, or nobody knows exactly how many, were killed, at least that many, and many more converted. This never happened before in Jewish history, at least not that we have records for. Okay? Uh, that huge numbers of Jews uh, convert to any religion, certainly to Christianity. We know about the occasional Meshumid. Uh, there are always, throughout history, a few Jews going this way and a few Christians going that way. That's normal. Right? That's uh, life. After all, there are some Jews who, t for example, eventually become convinced of the truth of another religion, just as there are people from other religions who become convinced of the truth of Judaism. If you want to go a little bit more than that, there are always some Jews who fall in love with a Christian girl and convert for that reason. There are always some Christians who fall in love with a Jewish girl and convert for that reason. There's that famous Tosfus in the Exodus where Rabbeinu Tom had to figure something out for the Jewish girl who converted. Uh, this is Zirma Susim Zirma Susim, for those who remember this Tosfus, where the Jewish girl converted and ran off with this French guy. Subsequently, she changed her mind and brought him back to become Jewish. And the question was, could they stay married? So you had this sort of thing, but not in the thousands and not in the tens of thousands. Uh, many historians down the ages have always um, put side by side, juxtaposed, uh, two opposites, which is not really fair, but the two opposites are 1096 and 1391. There are, I can't tell you how many articles and essays have that title. 1096 versus 1391. And, what of course, and now we're in the three weeks. Tisha B'Av is around the corner. We're going to have many keynotes about 1096. But the reason is, that's the year of the uh, Crusades, the first Crusades and the massacres in the Rhineland, north of there, in the, in, in the Rhine area. Uh, there, although there certainly were Jews who converted under duress, but it seems, as far as we can tell, that the majority of Jews uh, killed themselves and killed their own families rather than convert. In other words, they exhibited an extreme toughness and an absolute refusal. I mean, you can't get, who can, it, 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 we living today in America can't even conceive of the kind of religious pa passion that would move a parent to, to uh, you know, slaughter, which happened all the time who slaughtered his own family, and, and, and then himself, uh, it's, it's almost bizarre to us and can be only understood by the fact that these people had total faith and they figured like this, in five minutes we'll all be together, what's the difference? You understand? Better that than, than baptize. So uh, German Jewry, Rhineland Jewry, displayed an extreme uh, uh, tough stance towards the Crusaders. You come at us and, and, and the only thing you could do is throw their suicide back in their face. By contrast, in 1391, that did not happen. There were X number of Jews, as you read, who, for one reason or another, did not convert and were, and were killed or, 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 or weren't. Uh, but there were tens of thousands and maybe hundred thousand uh, who converted. But it's not really fair to lay that side by side, but it's been done very often. At that time, it was done. And Spanish Jews themselves, after this was all over, Jews who remained Jewish, and we're very religious, and I mean religious in the sense of being thoughtful, ask themselves, why did this happen to us, and why did we uh, fold like a house of cards? And there were a variety of explanations that they came up with. These are people who, so to speak, survived the Holocaust of 1391 period, and subsequently wrote about it in the early 1400s. Some of them, not surprisingly, said, it's our, it's our Averis. Uh, we Spanish Jews were too much into Maimonidean philosophy, and uh, we were too, uh, what we would say today, it's all the fault of modern orthodoxy, to use modern uh, terminology. And that's what they said. Shem Tov Ben Chendo wrote a book, Sefer Al Munoz, and, uh, and uh, there's a whole literature like that, and it will be repeated in 1492, and these are staples till today of Haredi uh, historiography. They're quoted all the time because they were written by contemporaries. These people made the argument that um, going back in the history of Spain, uh, the Spanish Jews were too well integrated with secular culture. Uh, they absorbed too much of it into Jewish life, 
uh, to the degree that it led to a weakening of the fiber of Yiddishkeit, as we would say today. And the proof of the pudding is when they came and put a gun to the head or a knife to the throat, uh, they folded, as I said before, like a house of cards. And the weakness demonstrated that the exposure to the secular uh, damaged the fabric of Judaism. And uh, you see over and over again the kind of um, rhetoric which says like this, the rich and the powerful and the ones with education, the ones who had a medical degree and a philosophy degree, who used to look down on us and used to say, you're uneducated, you don't even understand the Jewish religion, you're not a Maimonidean, you don't understand what the active intellect is, you don't understand the real Tommy Amitsis, all the rest of it, uh, you're a bunch of garnish. Uh, all those big talkers became Catholics, one, two, three. They had no courage. And the small fry, the guys that sat in the back of the shul, who what you call Yiddish Yidden, and they weren't educated, and anything, they just knew the regular Jewish Jewish, uh, they're the ones who gave their lives, who were willing to suffer, who somehow or other made it or didn't make it through all these periods, and uh, therefore a fee on all your fancy, schmancy, uh, secular, philosophical interpretations of Judaism. Obviously, other Jews <laughs> said that's baloney, and you know, there are other reasons for it as well. I mean, a mob is a mob. But what I'm trying to say is these tensions reveal themselves early, and it's called the crisis and the problem of 1391. It's, this is very well known. Uh, the results of all this were most unexpected, particularly by the non-Jews, by the non-Jews. You see, the Catholic Church, like every other religion, was used to what I just said before, a trickle of Jews always moving in this direction. Perhaps they don't like it, a trickle of Catholics moving in the direction of Judaism. A trickle you can absorb. As the Gemara says, comma, comma, butli. You know, a drop at a drop at a time you can absorb. So traditionally speaking, in the five, six, hundred, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, nine, all these hundreds, you always had a Jew here, a Jew there, perhaps even a family, that's kind of rare, who would convert. And then the local church would baptize them, obviously, and, you know, take them in, and to locate them in the uh, Christian community, or maybe move them out of town, whatever they did. And uh, very often, they get a little payoff, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that's the way it went. You know, you get, there's, there's a famous story they tell in Russia, uh, this is a Yiddish story, but it, it brings out a life. There was a Jewish guy, he was a little bit of a drunk and all the rest of it, so he, the way he made money was every week he converted, he went to this church, he got some 50 bucks, he went to that church, he 50 bucks, you know. And, and uh, finally, the Russian Orthodox Church put out a bulletin, you know, watch out for this guy, he went to the next church, they said, no way. He said, aren't the submitting over here, you know, they won't, they, they, they won't give a guy a break there, you know, that was against the Jews. This we're used to. This we're used to. But, a hundred Jews should convert at a time? A thousand? Ten thousand? Fifty thousand? What do you do with them? There was no infrastructure in the Catholic Church or in the Catholic life for the influx of a gigantic number of these converts, none of whom really wanted to be there. In the past, whoever converted, most of the time, did so um, voluntarily. When I say voluntarily, I mean maybe under pressure, under inducement, uh, but they came, they came they, you know, at the end of the day, they did it, you see? Maybe somebody did it because he doesn't like living the life of a Jew. Maybe somebody did it because he's in love with a girl. Maybe somebody did it for, uh, you know, a, a political reason or they want to rise at court. It's very common that rich Jews, once they get a certain amount of money, already think of trying to cross to the other side to make it bigger in the other way. You know, these kind of things were useful. But they were willing to do it at the end of the day. Here it's clear that these people had all been forced by mob violence. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe in Christianity. They, didn't, they certainly, I mean, somebody was pushed, you know, with, 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 with a sword at his throat or something, or, or they killed his brother next to him. Now you believe in the virgin birth. Now you believe in the immaculate conception and the transubstantiation and all the other wild things that you find within Christian doctrine. When you've been sort of brainwashed as a Jew to regard all this as nonsense, how come it flipped? You see? And so this triggered uh, something quite unexpected which was the phenomenon of the conversos. The phenomenon, I say, of the conversos as a huge group within Spain in the 1400s and afterwards. And I can tell you right now that this, uh, they, they, they won't, I'll, I'll take you through it hopefully, but the long-term consequence of this led to the expulsion of the non-converted Jews in 1492 because they said they're acting as a bad influence on the converted ones. Which means that the Catholic Church um, for its own reasons, decided 
once this great wave of conversions uh, took place, and I might add that it continued after 1391, but not so much with, a, with a, such a mob violence way. The marker had already been set. All the Jews knew what could happen. So whenever a large crowd of Christians got anywhere and started to look menacing, Jews in a particular, this town or that town would panic, and many would convert. Now, again, you can't blame anybody. Uh, you know, I told the Magam, as they say, you can't judge somebody until you get in their shoes. God forbid you'd see a, a crowd in front of this shoal, you know, who, <laughs> who, who would do what? But nevertheless, I mean, uh, that's what it was. Who would do what? But having said that, right, having said that, the official position of the Catholic Church earlier in the Middle Ages, and even, if you want to be technical about it, you'd be a, what you call a canon lawyer, uh, a bucky in the halachas of the Catholic Church, uh, even then, uh, onus doesn't count any more than it does in the Jewish religion. That is to say, if a conversion is done by forcing somebody at gunpoint or at knife point, it shouldn't count for what the reasons I just said. And historically speaking, the popes, interestingly, as well as others in the Catholic Church, when these particular violent episodes were over, did give permission, very interestingly, for those who had been forced to convert to go back. A very famous example is 1096. In the time of Ra uh, Rashi, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Rhineland, when uh, many Jews uh, did convert because of the Crusades, because of what I just said, uh, the Crusaders were there for a certain period of time, and then they left. And after they left, the locals were there. Well, the locals were not the ones who did it. It was the Crusading armies passing through. And so uh, once the bad guys, so to speak, had departed for the Holy Land, uh, the locals, in mines and worms and places like that, said to any Jews, um, okay, you can go back to being Jewish, because we know that the whole thing was an unforeseen episode of violence. To be very technical about it, there was a conference of the bishops and the big shots in the Holy Roman Empire, and a few years after 1096, presided over the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV, and they poskened the Shiloh, they issued the ruling that the Jews can go back, uh, which triggered a whole series of tensions that I've spoken about in the past within the Jewish communities, because a lot of people didn't want to take them back, since they had taken, quote unquote, the coward's way out. By contrast, and this was, as I say, common, you could point to other cases in the Middle Ages where this happened. Uh, same thing would be true in Jewish law. In order for something to be a gay risk, a conversion of Judaism, among other things, you have to have Kabbalah and mitzvahs, don't you? You have to have a sincere acceptance of the mitzvahs. The big problem that we have in Geras today is why such a big political football that you read about in the news, these rabbis don't recognize the conversion performed by those rabbis and vice versa. And in Israel and America, it all has to do with the question of the sincerity of the converts. Do they really mean what they say when they say to Makabal and Mitzvah that they take one Jews? And we all understand this. So in the case where it's done by force, right? I mean, imagine if such a thing happened, for example, in Israel today. Of course it doesn't. You know, if some... I'm just making this up. If some group of uh, Haredim went over to somebody and said, uh, we'll kill you if you don't convert to Judaism, it would have no standing. Mm -hmm. right? um, by contrast, right? by, by, by contrast, uh, this is not what happened in Spain. Now, there was no pope in office at that time. There were a bunch of popes fighting each other, so there was nobody to talk to at the, at the top. And so it had to do with the Catholic Church in Spain itself. The bishops and the archbishops and the others, had it been left to them, uh, they would have been convinced to uh, issue the usual rulings and say the Jews can go back. Uh, however, uh, the popular feeling was so powerful. We get, once again, as they say, this Rosh Limbaugh factor, where you had this guy, Fran Martinez, and a whole bunch of people after him, uh, carrying the fight uh, from town to town, ceaselessly, that if the bishops and the church guys would have said the Jews can go back to an uprising against the church hierarchy itself. What I'm trying to portray is a world in which uh, the poisoners of the atmosphere were so successful that they came to dominate the politics and the reality. And they therefore uh, put the pressure uh, successfully on the Catholic Church in Spain to take the position that uh, we know was all done by uh, onus, by, by force, and maybe it shouldn't have been done, but once it's done, it's done and everybody who's converted is a Catholic, cannot go back. If they go back, there will be pain of death. Right? Uh, that's quite a harsh and tough ruling. And we see over here that what we're really dealing with is 
uh, early example, perhaps the earliest, of racial anti-Semitism. And uh, there's no question about this, that uh, there's a strong racial element, as you'll see as I proceed tonight, in the popular feelings for the Jews, which persists all through the 13, 14, and, and hundreds and afterwards in Spain. Right. Uh, I might say that uh, you know, there, was a, there was a lot of intermarriage among the converted Jews with non-Jews, but uh, you know, the, the, those people were looked at as, as half and halves. And uh, eventually in Spain, they become very big in what they call the limpidity de sangre, the purity of the blood. Are you totally a Christian, or do you have a Jewish blood in you? And it becomes sort of proto-Hitlerian, although it wasn't. I mean, if you converted, you meant that you were safe. So it wasn't Hitler. There's a difference. But uh, you understand what I'm saying as well. Um, to uh, further complicate the situation, as the 1390s uh, go by, um, very important uh, Mishumadim, converts to Judaism, and uh, Catholic priests themselves uh, step forward in this frenzy and uh, carry everything I just said to an even greater a fever pitch, if that's possible. Uh, the most famous of these guys, let's go to the one after him. Famous is these guys got this off the Wikipedia, is Vincent Ferrer, who, as you see over here, became a saint in the Catholic Church. He led flagellants around, you understand? They went from city to city in huge numbers in Spain. Think about what I'm saying, of people who whipped themselves as part of a religious frenzy. You and I are used to this by seeing with the Shiite Muslims that they do this on certain holidays, right? Uh, whipped themselves bloody. Uh, they do this in a frenzy of Catholic passion uh, with statues, and, uh, you know, carrying on the Virgin Mary and carrying the saints. Now, we, thankfully, don't see any of this in America. Uh, the reason we don't see any of this in America are, well, there's a number of reasons, but a, a big reason is it's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country. That's the way it was founded. The founding fathers of the countries were Protestants. There were a couple of Catholics around, but they were actually discriminated against. Right? The Maryland being, a, as you know, the Catholic state. Uh, George Washington, Thomas Edison, I mean Thomas Jefferson, and all these other guys, Benjamin Franklin, they're all, they're all, they're all uh, uh, Protestants. Protestantism arose later on in Europe, uh, among other things, turned off by the wearing the religion on the sleeve. They say it shall be internal. You get it? Uh, Protestants don't like marching around Yom and with, uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, Corpus Christi parades, with huge people carrying on marching and singing in the street with all kinds of images and idols and uh, incense. And so Catholics like that in the Catholic, Catholic countries. In this country, they haven't developed that. Although if you go to Little Italy, a place like that, they have these little things, but they're pretty harmless in America. They were not harmless in Spain. And so the Jews were under constant blows from 1391 down to about 1420, uh, pretty much, uh, where this guy, Vincent Ferrer, will lead ever larger crowds into a Jewish uh, neighbor knows, go to a town, first of all, make a couple of speeches in the church, and then he would, um, look at this, uh, Vincent Ferrer, whose fiery the eloquence of Valencia had been due, continued to travel around preaching to the Jews, endeavoring to secure their conversion. In 1411, he went all through Castile from one end to the other, in pursuance of which he come to regard as his mission. In one town after another, he appeared in the synagogue, bearing a safer Torah in one arm and a crucifix on the other with an unruly mob at his heels, adding force to his arguments. Imagine that scene. It, it's really scary. When you go into the center, you can't, well, you can't keep him out. It's their country. Everywhere, many persons allowed themselves to be won over by his impassioned appeals and by the threat of violence. On a single day in Toledo, he said to have gained 4,000 converts. Whole communities gave way en masse. In the Bishopric of Segovia, the remnants of Judaism were entirely destroyed. Then he went to Aragon, where he followed a similar course. And he was assisted by other Jews. It was a nightmarish situation. I tell you the truth. Those Jews who didn't convert are heroes. In, in other words, I don't understand, standing here today, how people were able to withstand this kind of pressure. And you couldn't appeal to the king or the queen because nobody was home. As I said, well, there was a regency and they were fighting with each other and there was nobody strong in charge. And so it's not even clear to us today why every single Jew wasn't forced to convert. But it would most likely be due to the fact that they figure it's working very well, you know, it's not necessary. 
every time this guy comes into town or another guy comes to town, you get another couple hundred, another couple thousand. Give it a couple years and everybody will, 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 will have it on their own. Now, these people, think about what I just said. Um, halachically, I'm using the Catholic sense of halacha, nobody put a gun to their head. But they were persuaded by his eloquence. You see? Uh, the mob and all that was just there for window dressing. Right? N nobody made them do it. You can just see, by the way, everything I'm saying really was debated among the Catholic uh, canon lawyers. You know, they said, what exactly is the duress? What exactly is force? And, you know, maybe if they tortured somebody, you know, eh, but if, if it's less, it, at what point does it have a, a din of inus? Right? And uh, the result was that these kind of things surged throughout the country uh, constantly. So it was a terrible period. 1391, therefore, uh, launches uh, a, a terrible episode uh, in, in, in the history of the Jews of Spain and exposes the weakness of the existence of the Jews there, how dependent it was on things just being right. And whenever the, all the ducks weren't in shape, if there wasn't the right king there, if it wasn't the right bishop there, all the rest, it could fall apart like a house of cards so easily. And so they imagined, I'm sure the Jews did, oh, we have friends at court, we have Jews who were big shots in the government, they're in charge of the finances, they're very necessary the economy, you know, ye uh, atov, it'll be good. And it wasn't. Right? Yeah, Mamsh fell apart. A very tough uh, period. This continued all through the 1390s, everything I'm saying. Uh, they made ever more converts. Let's go back to the previous one. Including, for example, this guy, who maybe you can sort of tell, once was a Chashva Rav. It actually was a Rashiva. Right? Uh, Pablo de Santa Fe. Paulo Burgos. Who, who uh, Santa Fe means the sacred faith. Yeah? I always like the idea there's a Chabad in Santa Fe. You know? But the... But, but, <laughs> It's, it, it's, it's a revenge. But uh, this uh, Pablo de Santa Maria, okay, Paul of St. Mary, no, he's devoted to the Virgin Mary, what is mentioned in the Shalos and Shibas of She's Rav Shalom Halevi. He was once upon a time a Chashva uh, rabbi who, uh, in this whole thing, I mean, let this guy Ferrer, uh, we don't know the details, uh, switches over, becomes a Catholic. When he becomes a Catholic, he rises to the top in the hierarchy. His wife wouldn't go, his kids wouldn't go. It'd be quite a novel. Right? As I say before, just from any one of these scenes, you have material for five mini-series, not for one. Right? You really do. Uh, but he ran with the main chance, and uh, he became eventually the, like the confessor to the queen and, and things like this. He writes a ton of books in Hebrew against Judaism, bringing all the Gemaras. He knows them, and all the Midrashim, and all the Catholic interpretations. I guarantee you, I don't think there were very, very few Jews that were persuaded by you know, these kinds of literature, any more today than anyone reads the Hebrew material put out by the missionaries. But the fact is uh, that you had people like this running. There was a guy before him called Abner Burgos, who also seems to have been a Talmud Chacham and then converted and published all kinds of books uh, in Hebrew, circulating, disproving the Jewish religion. You can't blame people, so to speak, converting under this kind of pressurized situation, but we blame the ones who were particularly vicious and um, the nadir, the lowest point of this period, happens in the early 1400s when the uh, part of a political machination, the Jews are forced to come to a vikuach, a disputation, like the Ramban had earlier before in Tortosa, which is, let's go back to the map here for a second, all the way up there, right, right near the, the French border, okay? on Tortosa to come and debate once again the same, rehash the old arguments that the Ramban had with Pablo Christiani, that Yechila Paris had with uh, Nicholas Donner back in the 1240s. Uh, we're we're going to tell over what the Gemara, you know, proves over here that Jesus is really Messiah and all this kind of thing. Jews didn't want to go in, in, in any way. They had to go. Now the truth of the matter is, uh, is really disgusting because, uh, as I said, in the history of the Catholic Church, you had a bunch of popes all opposing each other in the 1300s. In the, late 1913, in the late 1300s, they tried to patch it up, and they weren't successful, because the three or four guys who were popes, neither one would give up his job so that one guy would take over. That's understandable. And uh, one of the worst of them was Benedict XIII, and the anti-pope Benedict XIII, who was Spanish, a Spanish bishop, who uh, made his own little uh, minion, as it were. And the result was, if you look at the year 1400, you have to understand 
The, the Catholics in France recognize this guy as the Pope. The Catholics in England recognize another guy. The Catholics in Spain, in fact, in Castile, recognize one guy in Aragon, another guy. It was a Hefkeris world. But the Catholics themselves were realizing that this situation cannot continue, and that the whole point and beauty of the Catholic Church is they have one guy in charge at the top. And so there were big tendencies which culminated in the 1415, 1416, and what they call the Council of Constance, in which they finally decided on one pope and start all over again. So the guys who were there didn't want this to happen. They're going to lose their job, especially this guy Benedict the Thirteenth, who really wasn't there for a pope. He was a popola, you know. He he had, you know, he he had support here and there, but he's grasping one there. And he saw little by little that whatever chances he has for holding on to the title of pope were slipping away. And so he got an idea, considering what's going on particularly now in Spain, maybe he can capitalize on it, and if he'll have a big debate, and will force the Jews to admit the truth of Christianity, and this can lead to a big wave of conversion to Judaism, which he generated, to be unbelievable PR, and he'll get uh, uh, support throughout the rest of the Catholic world for his tremendous achievements. You understand? That, that, that's what it, exactly what it was. So he did this as a ploy, and uh, he summoned a bunch of Jewish leaders, a bunch of rabbis, and he said, don't worry, you'll be treated in fine, it'll be like your own body and better, you say whatever you want, and, you know, uh, we'll pay for a room and board, and all this will be, and they said, no, 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 and he said, yes, 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 and uh, finally, they felt compelled to attend, and they really didn't want to. And none of them were the Ramban. Ramban was a tremendous personality, obviously. Uh, it doesn't, you don't need me to tell you that he was a totally expert in the Jewish stuff, and he was a pretty doggone expert in the Christian stuff as well. The Ramban was the Ramban. The people who were there in 1413 in Tortosa were rabbis, you know, were community leaders, uh, good Jews, but uh, placed in a, in a situation that nobody here would ever want to in a thousand years. I sure wouldn't. Okay. And uh, so they're compelled to attend, and, uh, went, and, and, and it was all lies, because they said everybody would be treated nice and fairly, but as soon as they came into the place, it was like uh, Camden Yards, it was like a baseball field, you know, and the whole place is full of Catholics, and they're going boo, 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 and the Pope is sitting there on, t on top of the papal throne, and, uh, you know, and he's saying, damn you all, and this is, you know, to prove the damnable religion that you have, and now we're going to have our side give irrefutable proofs about the falseness of Judaism, and particularly, like in the case of the Ramban, that the Talmud itself demonstrates the divinity of Jesus and the fundamental, uh, you know, uh, things of the Christian religion. Now, the Ramban was at a time in 1263 when there was a king in Aragon, a strong guy who wasn't going to, James I, who wasn't going to any monkey business and no law, uh, outbreaks of disorder, and who guaranteed him freedom of, uh, of, of, uh, of speech and could say whatever he wanted, and who did back him up, although even he, if you remember last week, after it was all over, was forced by papal pressure to tell him, I can't really carry out the, the guarantees of, of uh, safe conduct that I, that I offered you, and I'm advising you to get out of here and move to Israel before you know, the law really uh, reaches its course. So if that was true back in the so-called good old days when you had a sympathetic pretty fair and very strong king, you can imagine how much worse it was in Tortosa in 1413 when you have this popola, as I say before, who's all really talking to the Catholic world, trying to show what a zealous Catholic I am and therefore support my pretensions to the papal throne uh, because I can beat up on these Jews. And why would he go after the Jews? Why not? They can do nothing. Well, and so when one reads the uh, records of the disputation of Tortosa, as they call it, in 1413, one sees a disputation that went on for over a year. For over a year. First, the Jews were compelled to debate orally, and then the Jews said, listen, we're not Clarence Doe over here. We're not, we, you, you just picked a bunch of rabbis, community leaders. We're not experienced debaters. Uh, Duran Bond was, but, but we're not. Uh, we're rabbis, so we don't know everything about Judaism, um, and we don't know how to answer all these uh, medrashes and uh, things you uh, present to us. And certainly, it's hard to have presence of mind when you're surrounded by such an unbelievably hostile crowd, which looks like at any minute they're going to run out and tear you to bits. I can tell you that one of the Jewish delegates had a heart attack and died in the middle of the debates, and it's perfectly understandable. And I said, no, there's the pressures that they were subjected to. This is what they call a fair debate in the Middle Ages. I'm serious. This is considered fair. Right? What was unfair was when the Ramban spoke up. And uh, so this went on for a long, long time, 
uh, one of the Jewish delegates converts under pressure. You know, they're scared to death. You know, all they say is like, we know where you live, we know where your wife and family live, and all that. This is what they did. They play horrible. And, uh, and the remaining delegates actually couldn't present a united front because they had different opinions on Judaism. Because guess what? When it comes to matters of uh, theology and doctrine, uh, there's no one Jewish opinion on a lot of things. Is, do we have a single opinion on who and what the Mashiach is? Do we have a single opinion, for example, on Hashkocha Protis and Hashkocha Chos, on the nature of divine providence? Do we have a single opinion on the exact nature of what, of how God communicated the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu? The answer is we do not. We have a variety of opinions. The Rambam says Hazari, the Rambam says differently, sometimes very strong disagreements. Rashi learns another way. This is well known. The Jewish religion strove throughout the Middle Ages and afterwards, still does today, for strove for a kind of uniformity in the area of practice. They didn't even achieve that, right? When all said and done, the Ashkenazim do this, the Sephardim, as we all knew, do that, the Yemenites do a third thing, even in the area of practice. But certain things we have in common, right? I mean, no one agrees. No one would say, as I always say, you can light a match on Saturday. Everybody agrees you can't eat a ham sandwich. You know, we have a, we, we do have a core of, of laws and rules to which we all agree and which unite Jews everywhere. If I, as I say, went to Yemen or saw Singapore, who knows where, obviously I might find things that are somewhat different in some degree. But fundamentally, Shabbos would be Shabbos. Kashas would be Kashas. You know, we're given a little bit of changes. You know no one would serve you ham or shrimp. You know, there, there, there are certain fundamentals in there. But if it's a matter of hashkafa, as we call it today, of philosophy, so who's right? Is it the Agudah? Is it the Mizrahi? Is it the Hasidim? Is it the Misnagdim? Is it the modern Orthodox? Is it the centrist? Is it the Two Jews, three opinions. We, we know that. It's never changed. It was true in the 1400s, like it's true in the year 2009. It was true in the year 9. This is a basic feature of Judaism. And by the way, it's, it's merely a reflection of the fact that we acknowledge so once you talk about God and the infinite and the unknowable, how can there be the doctrine? The cat, and they, by the way, they use these words in the debate to the Pope. They say, you're used to arguing in syllogisms, and this is foreign to the Jewish rhetoric. He, of course, has no idea what they're talking about. And he said, well, because you guys are not arguing. And so, as um, famous scholars have pointed out, it was a dialogue at a death, you know, two trains are passing each other. So you can rehearse the same kind of, literally rehearsed, the same kind of arguments that Ramban said. You see, it says in the Medrash that the Mashiach was born on Tisha B'Av, so that means he already came, and the Jews say, well, just because he came doesn't mean he was born, it doesn't mean he came, you know, just like Ramban said, you get back in, into all this sort of thing. And anyway, the Jews end up saying, some of them end up saying, Mashiach is not even an acre of the Jewish religion. You know, uh, who says that, uh, you know, you Catholics are all preoccupied by the question of the Messiah? Who even says there is a Messiah? Which they say, what are you talking about? And then the Rambam include the Mashiach as one of his 13 principles. And one of the leading Jewish participants of it says, the Rambam was wrong. He was wrong on a lot of things. This is the Arias of Alba, who subsequently wrote a book called the Sefer Hol Ikarim. Right? The book of the principles in which he argues there aren't 13 principles, only four, or something like that. And he got it out of this debate. And the point is that uh, it was a travesty, but it worked. Why? It whipped up the frenzy of the crowds, and it caused even more Jews under economic pressure, uh, murder pressure, religious pressure, to convert. And so it's just a disastrous uh, period in Jewish history. And it only stopped in uh, the late 14, around, close to the year four, uh, uh, 1420. Because in this year, the queen, who was the real Machshefa, she died, the queen mother. The next year, uh, Vincent Ferrer died. The year after that, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, uh, Paula Burgos died. And uh, do, he had made a Talmud, a Jewish guy who once was also a rabbi named Lorky, Joshua Lorky, Lorky of the town of Spain, who, uh, I don't have a picture of, who became Geronimo de Santa Fe, the, uh, Jerome of the Sacred Faith, who the Jews called Megadev, Maestro Geronimo de Santa Fe. Megadev means blasphemer. And uh, the atmosphere was complete. But what happened to the Spain that you and I know? What happened to the Spain of the Golden Age? What happened to the Spain of the Ramban and the Rajwa of the Reshe. Disappeared like a house of cards. It, 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 it's a perfect example of the tenuous nature of Jewish existence in even a relatively good country 
in the medieval context. If this could happen in Spain, worse things happen in England, France, Germany, and places like that. And they did in the terrible 13 and 1400s. And so uh, this shows us the meaning of Gaulus, of exile, in which uh, any illusions the Jews had of being some kind of secure or having found a niche within the medieval economy or the political structure uh, was revealed to have been an illusion. Right? Things changed because these very evil people, as we would call them, died over a number of years. Uh, the Pope who did this uh, was discredited in spite of his efforts to win points in the Catholic public opinion. He ended up living in a castle in Pensacola, not in Florida, but in Spain. And, uh, <laughs> and he, you know, it, really, he lived in an illusion world. He lived in a palace. He appointed like 100 cardinals and made his own little Catholic church and all that until the king of Spain put him in exile. It was, it was, the whole thing didn't work. But look at the Jews who suffered as a result of his Mishigas. Um, in the late uh, 1410s, like 1418, 1419, the Catholic Church finally got its act together. Uh, they got a pope who was a real pope that everybody agreed to, Pope Martin V. The Jews in Italy immediately went to him with all kind of persuasive arguments. And, uh, and they got him to, and, and not that he loved the Jews, but he was a pope pope. And he issued a famous uh, bull uh, which said, whereas the Jews are made in the image of God, and a remnant of them will one day be saved, and whereas they have besought our protection, Following in the footsteps of our predecessors, we command that the Jews not be molested in their synagogues, that their laws, rights, and customs not be assailed, that they not be baptized by force, constrained to observe Christian festivals, nor to wear new badges, and that they not be hindered in their business relations with Christians. Yeah. As a pope. And I'll say again, he didn't love the Jews or anything like that, but they didn't approve of this violence business, and they felt a bad consciousness at forcing people who don't really believe to become Catholics because, you know, what do you gain? Let me ask you the following question. Well, would we like it if, in Baltimore, Maryland, there was an influx of 10 or 20,000 people who overnight, even if it wasn't by violence, said, we all decided to become Orthodox Jews and we want to join the community. But we wouldn't even want it. Right? Again, if you're talking about one, 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 a few at a time, that's one thing you can observe it. If you had 20,000, 30,000, the Jewish the from community in Baltimore is about 20,000. If you have another 20, 30,000, it create an impossible situation. This becomes the reality in Spain from 1391 to 1492. And uh, it's called the converso problem. And it's a problem for the Jews, and it's a problem for the Christians. It's obviously a problem for the Jews, because it's my brother, my uncle, my cousin. You have to understand, uh, two br it happens all the time, two brothers. One is walking, so to speak, on Park Heights, and the other one is walking on Rice Town Road. The mob happens to run down Rice Town Road. Bad luck. They run into that brother, they put a knife to his throat, and they say, if you don't convert, I will kill you, and he deconverts. He had no choice. He did right, he did wrong, he did it. The other brother, just by pure luck, wasn't walking on Rice Town Road. He was working on Park Heights. Never happened to him. He went to Medica. He went home. The Marno. 24 hours are over. This one's not a Catholic. And this one's a Jew. What changed in the two brothers? The answer is nothing and everything. Really, where does the brother on Rice Town Road live? The answer is he lives on Pinckney. Right around the shore. Where does the brother who wasn't converted? He lives a few doors away. The Catholic Church didn't say, because it wasn't done by the church, it was done by mobs, didn't say, okay, now the one who converted, now move to Towson or something like that. He didn't say that. They didn't do anything. They just forced them to convert. And so what's going to happen? The guy who's on Pinckney goes back to a Jewish neighborhood. He still feels like he wants to die in Mincha, the Agoda, or wherever. His brother over here, his cousin's over there. Next week is a wedding in the family. There's a brisk down the block with the neighbor. Pesach is coming around the corner, Pesach Hotel. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? In other words, the rhythm of life wasn't changed as a result of the conversion very often. And so, that guy is not going to show up, in, if, if he can get away with it, that's a big if, if he can get away with it, he's not going to show up in church. 
or certainly not often. And if the police say, oh, we're keeping a list of the people who never show up in church, so at the most what you'll do is, you show up once in a while, just to stay on the right side of the law. And the type of person I'm asking, when the next time he goes to a bar mitzvah, or a kiddush rishon somewhere, and they say, well, how does it feel to be a Catholic? You know what he's going to say. Well, yeah. don't, don't tell the cops. Don't tell the local priest. Or the guy might even say this, I don't care, tell him. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? The conversion was of such a crazy nature and such an unprecedented, uh, unexpected, uh, and unplanned mob scene that uh, it didn't take with a lot of people. The Catholics, in particular the Catholic Church, were in consternation. They shouldn't have been, but they were. They said, wait a minute, that's not following the rules of the game. The rules of the game is someone converts Catholic, it's done, so you live a life of a Catholic. Now, the Jews didn't get together as a group and say, well, it's not fair the way you did it to us, huh? But that's what they felt. And so you get a crazy situation of unbelievable complexity where they'll put pressure on this guy more and more. You know, you have to come to church more often. Next week is Easter, this is Christmas, and all the rest of it. And at the same time, the Jewish relatives and the others are saying, we, you know, tomorrow is the, uh, the bris. You know, the pigeon, are you coming to the pigeon? Ben, we need a minion. Yeah? And... Uh, and then the rabbi is asked the question, you know, say, can you count this guy for a minion? You know, it is a, it's unbelievable uh, complexity. Now, during the 20 years of 1391, the 30 years of 1421 approximately, you know, more or less, uh, these questions are not asked. Because then the heat is on, as I've tried to indicate. You know, Vincent Ferrer is coming through, and the Pablo de Santa Maria is coming through, and Pope Benedict is coming through. I mean, really coming through with mobs and things like this. You know, you, you don't fool around in that environment. But finally, the bad guys died, a strong king came on the throne of Aragon, and a somewhat strong king came on the throne of Castile. Once you get a strong king on there, and Aragon is Alfonso V, for example, this guy is a Renaissance prince. He fights major wars in Italy, he tries to conquer Sicily, he gets involved with the wars of the right and left with everybody. Oh, this is a king we're used to. That kind of, guy, well, uh, what do I say? If you're fighting wars, and you're a Renaissance prince, one thing you obviously need is what? Money, and therefore you need? Right. And now we're back in business. You see? And so, Alfonso V, I can tell you right now, he's like this, I will have no riots here, and no anything, and I'm not going to whip two people, or I'll burn down the neighborhood, I'll kill everybody, you know? And once you do that, then they don't move. And so from 1420 on, there is restoration of law and order in, in Aragon, and, and a little bit later in Castile as well. And so then, these issues start to happen. What happened to these converse? It was. Well, it's been 10 years, 20 years since it happened, maybe longer. Very complex situation. Some fully convert, and they say, didn't plan on it. I was just walking down Roystown Road one day, but here it is. Others say, you know, I got married now to a Catholic girl, or something. Not only say that, and others say, I spit on Christianity. I spit on all this. They made me do this. I hate them. Really, I'm never going to go to church, or at least more than I have to, and I want you to count me for a minion, and all that. You had a whole wide variety of responses among what we call the conversos. How wide this variety was is a big machlokas till this day among the historians. Bibi Netanyahu's father has this very fat book um, where he spends his whole life at the Dropsy in Cornell trying to make the argument that the great majority of the Jews uh, fully converted to Catholicism. Uh, other historians, uh, Yanta Vasij and most famously Fritz Baer said no, the great majority of Jews stayed religi as religious as they possibly could. Uh, we'll never know, obviously. This is long before there was an Inquisition. Right? The Inquisition was installed to 1480. That's not what people think. And so in that environment, it's kind of crazy what's going on. Now, here an unexpected thing happens. The Catholics decide they made a big mistake. But they didn't. But they did. But they didn't. What does that mean? They didn't want the Jews to convert. They weren't any Jews running around as Jews. But on the other hand, if they're not Jews anymore, they can go to a country club. <laughs> can't keep them out. They sit next to the church. Uh, the Jews start to show up at, uh, at, at, at uh, civic uh, you know, council meetings. Next to the Hidalgos and the other big shots. How are you going to keep them out? They're, 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 they're Christians. Right? Uh, and what if the Jew really means it? So he is a believing Christian, but he's a Jew. <laughs> In other words, the racism factor asserts itself and uh, really complicates things very much. Uh, I can tell you right now, over the course of the 1410s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and all the rest of it, 
uh, the Jewish problem, which is what I just described, asserts itself ever heavily. Because the kings and the other rulers, um, they'll say like this, these guys are Jewish. Well, they're not Jewish. They're conversos now. They're Catholics like the rest of us. But they still got the Jewish mind. They still go with the money. Right? I want him for the CPA. Right? The Catholics say, why don't you get a Catholic Catholic? They say, what do you mean Catholic? They're all the same. You see? And so this raises the tensions to a very strong level. When Jews start to attain all kinds of posts in the government that they never had before. And then this really raises anti-Semitism, although it's a Mishagas. Because it shouldn't be anti-Semitism, but as I tell you before, they hate the Jews for being a Jew. So under the old regime, when there were Jewish Jews, the only job a Jew could possibly get would be with the money, you know, either the IRS, or something connected with the taxes, or the Treasury Department, or things of this nature, or, in rare, or, or they would be contractors for the army and this sort of thing, that we understand, <laughs> or maybe they would be sent on diplomatic missions to Arab countries and others because they know the lingo. But all the other departments of the government, and the church, were for Goyim, <laughs> people who were really Goyim. And now, how are you going to keep them out? And so the result is that, ironically, it triggers a great wave of anti-Semitism, even though it should have been a, a period of, of triumph. Right? For the Jews, it created, obviously, with the Jewish context, extraordinary problems in many ways. Uh, there's a very famous case, and it, I'll tell you a very famous tshuva, a very famous case in Jewish law uh, from this period, which illustrates uh, beautifully, the complexity of this period. Uh, and then the Shuvah was Harivosh. The Rivosh was a bit, Rabbi Yitzhak Barsheshesh was the leading rabbi in Aragon. He was the God of Ador, you might say. And uh, his kids were killed in, in, in 1391. And these riots that happened in Barcelona, he jumped on a ship, went to here, to uh, Algeria. This is when the Jewish community of Algeria really starts. Okay? He's recognized by the Muslim leader, there's the chief rabbi, and all this kind of business, and he's the one. Well, look what I just did. He ran away. A bunch of Jews start to run away. The Moroccan Jews today, the Algerian Jews, if they're Sephardim and many, of, uh, probably most of them are, it dates from 1391 to 1492. This is really when it happens. Because before then, why would a Jew move to North Africa from Spain? Things they thought were better in Spain than in North Africa. Not anymore. Not if you want to be a Jewish Jew. And so a whole variety of human stories now breaks out. And here's the famous one. Oh, but one of, uh, uh, of 10,000, there's a girl who's married to a boy. And she's Jewish and he's Jewish. No, they're not. They're both conversos. Right? And, uh, and she and he both converted because they were walking on Rice's Town Road. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And she's a Yiddish Yid. She did, she did what she had to do, but she's planning whenever she can to get out of there and, and come out of the closet and live a Jewish life. This is what she yearns for. And he says he is. But when push comes to shove, uh, a number of years go by, and then there's a chance to get out. By that time, she hasn't cooled down, but he has. She says, we have a chance to run away and go to North Africa and come out of closet and be Jewish. And he said, you know, I got a chance for promotion. You know, it goes, it says, hey, we just got a new car, a new horse, and uh, he doesn't want to leave. You can understand both emotions. It's interesting that she's the one. So... They have their domestic fights and all the rest of it. And after all said and done, one day she goes shopping. No, she doesn't. She goes shopping and goes to the boat and, get, and just jumps in. I'm telling you about anything. And she lands in Algiers. She lands in Algiers. She comes to the Jewish community, mostly composed of people like herself. Right? This is the emotions of the times. When she comes over there, she said, my husband, good for nothing, garnish, you know, he's a traitor to Judaism, to the devil with him. Now I'm 21 years old. I want to get on with my life. She's married. She can get married again. Am I right or am I wrong? So, because she was married to the guy. And so, my sin b'chol yom, they say, we don't know, go to the Rivosh. He's the big rabbi. He's the Rav Moshe Feinstein of the Torah. He's the guy you got to go to. And she goes, and he says, oy vey, she's married, all the rest of it, but I'm not going to allow the normal first thought to wreck up her life. I mean, that would be a travesty. That her life should be ruined. She's the hero. She's the Jewish one. And so he composed the famous tshuva, his responsum in Jewish law, famous ruling Jewish law, in which he says like this, where did they get married? In Catholic church. It's true that the priest was Jewish. Everybody, this is true. Everybody in the church was Jewish. 
You understand, they're all conversos, right? All the Ada, everybody was Jewish, and they lived certainly together, husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, no question about that, all the rest of it doesn't count. Why doesn't it count? Because in order to get married, you need Kedushin, and Kedushin is interpreted not simply as two people wishing to live as husband and wife. That does not suffice. You have to be Kedushin as the Jewish Kedushin, as we say, Kedas Moshe of Yisrael. That, you, that, that in order for a marriage to have uh, effect, it has to be that the two parties want a Jewish type marriage, a halachic marriage. And that was not present in a Catholic church when it had the ceremony where the guy made the sign of the cross over them, even though everybody there was Jewish. Uh, it's an interesting ruling, right? And he even raises the question, what about the fact that the Gemara says, some will know what I'm talking about, that just living by themselves, uh, that when they live as husband and wife itself, the very act of living together intimately should constitute a Maise Kedushin, an act of Kedushin. He said, no, it doesn't. Right? They all figured that the only marriage that counts is the one that was done in the church, and that doesn't count. And if you say, as the halachi principle is bilos of bilos nus, that a person doesn't want to live in sin. Huh? But that's what they're doing. They're living in sin. I mean, they're living. Or did they keep the laws of Taras and Mishpacha? Right? Did they keep the laws of Kashrus? You can't tell me that these people have in mind that they want to live a life of sanctity according to the laws of Moses and Israel. Give me a break. And as a result of that, she's not married to the bum, and you, you, and you go on. This is the first of, I, I don't exaggerate when I say hundreds and maybe thousands of rulings between 1391 and 1791, that constitute the area of what we call the ha Marano Halacha. Right? Because starting now, and they'll build up even more after 1492, there will be cases like this all the time. One party leaves, the other one doesn't. This, you know, one stays here, that one doesn't. This brother stays here, the other brother goes away. And you have as many tragedies as you can imagine. Yibum, uh, you know, Gitin, and things of this nature. And uh, the, the rabbi I just mentioned wasn't, uh, you know, a reform rabbi. The Mary Bush was the leading Orthodox rabbi of the, of the age. And the people who come after him in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, are the leading Sephardic poskim, the Marashtam, Marin Leib, people with famous names who bend and twist as much as the law will permit to, accom to do what they can to accommodate the escapees going so far. You'll be surprised at what I'm about to say going so far in later centuries to rule in specific occasions that it's not true that once you're Jewish, you're always Jewish. This is what you and I always say all the time, right? Once you're Jewish, you're Jewish. You can't get out of it. Right? You can't convert to another religion. And the Mars Dom in his time, so just, who says? It's in the Gemara. Let's read the Gemara again. Look at it very closely. And by the time the discussions are finished, uh, some of these uh, post and they are post will say like this. If you have a Jew, uh, fine. Once they convert to another religion, they're not Jewish anymore. It's interesting. Why do they say this? Why are they looking to find these arguments within the law? Because you'll have a situation, not like I just described, not where the marriage was held in a Catholic church. What if the couple that I'm talking about had been married with Chubba Kedushin before 1391? And then came the great riots. And then they were both compelled to convert. And then afterwards, she ran away. Wouldn't be able to say the marriage was not a marriage in the first place, would you? She'd be stuck. She would be in a guna. And these Sephardic rabbis, who were flesh of their flesh of blood, that's what I'm trying to say. They, this is the, what we call the responsa, the shalos and shuva. That's where you take the halacha in your practical situations. They knew because they themselves came from these families. They understood exquisitely the tortures and the natures of the difficulties that these people had gone under. And they said, we're going to do whatever we can even reaching the most far-reaching conclusions, because that's really out of the general consensus. Usually we say, Yisrael, Afa Pishachata, Yisrael who? A Jew, even if he sinned, remains a Jew. And yet some of them will say like this, who says that's the meaning of the words? Maybe it means something else. You see? Maybe it means something else. I mentioned this to show you that the consequences of 1391 uh, were enormous, both in the non-Jewish and in the Jewish part, I want to make one uh, concluding remark, which is also very interesting. What happened after 1420 when the Holocaust, so to speak, was over? And when some kind of sanity was restored to Spain? They had a strong king in Aragon and one in Castile. Jews could get back on their feet. They were devastated. Half and sometimes total communities were wiped out one way or another, or converted, 
the Jews themselves were reduced to poverty very often. Although, you know how it goes, in a capitalist economy, even somebody with poverty, give them five years. So, you know, that, that, that is what happened. But, you know, what, what do you do? So the Jews get together in 1432, and they, uh, all, and they say the situation can't go on as it is. Judaism is going down the tubes, and they get together, and they issue the Takanas of Valladolid, Valladolid being a major city in Castile. And it's very interesting. What they say is like this. What happened, happened, the past is past, and now we have to concentrate in the future. All the money goes to Chinuch. All the money goes to Jewish education. We're going to raise a tax on the shrita, on the kosher food, and all the rest of it. And 90%, I mean, you've got to fund other things also, but 90% of the money, I won't read it to you because it's late, 90% of the money goes for elementary schools, free yeshivas, in every town, they have the poor appointment. We're, we're going to rebuild Judaism, and the only way you can rebuild it, not through a JCC, not through uh, Jewish family services, uh, not through uh, demographic studies of the uh, population, and all that, uh, but we're going to put it into education. And I can just tell you now uh, that it's quite remarkable they pulled it off. That as a result of this, there was, uh, as, of, of this rechanneling of communal funds, a great movement of, uh, shall I say, Torah education arose, starting from the 1430s on, so much so that they created a golden age of Torah scholarship in the midst of all this junk in the 1400s, um, not that the names are so familiar to you, Yitzhak Kampantan, Yitzhak Abalav, and others like that, um, that they raised the level of Torah knowledge among the Sephardic Jews to a very high level, so that when they were kicked out in 1492, they exited Spain and relocated to other places, particularly around the Mediterranean, and Sephardiized them. They came to Israel, to Egypt, to Turkey and Greece, and even Italy and North Africa, and they said, we're taking over because we're the big Talmudic Chacham around here, and they were. And that's why these people today are Sephardim. By blood, they may not be, if you go back, some aren't, some aren't, but by culture, they were culturally imperialized by the Sephardim, who reached such a great level of knowledge and expertise in Judaism as a result of the bounce back that took place in the wake of the Holocaust that had concluded by the 1420s, and by their decision as I said before, put all their eggs in a basket, in a basket with education, because that's the only <laughs> basket that works uh, with, with, with Judaism. Are there any questions? I'll take two, three questions. Isn't the real problem with the conversions is they reach such a high level in the, in the Christian society? Well, that's, I, said, I mentioned you, know, you couldn't keep them out of the country club. The finance, finance the finance ministry had always been with Jews. You know, that's a, who, was, who was the finance minister in 1492? The Abarbanal. He was not a convert. The money positions is not a surprise. The problem is when it becomes what we call today the Minister of Education. You understand? The Minister of Culture, the Minister of Housing. That's a different story. You understand? So uh, is it possible to surmise that the, this uh, renewed commitment to a Jewish education was in a way a sense of what they saw as the difference between what happened in 1391 and 1096? That could, did they feel that if uh, there had been more put into Jewish education prior to the mobs and the, the programs that uh, maybe they would have... That, that's, a, that's a great question. He's saying, is the fact they poured all the money into Jewish education a reaction to 13 I don't know. I don't think so. I think that long time ago, they didn't have all the modern Mishigas we have today. People had, were, 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 had a lot of basic... Comp These were businessmen. The business people... They don't know from all the different tricks and sticks. They say like this, if, if your goal is to rebuild Judaism, we all know what the way is. The people in charge of the money in Baltimore and elsewhere today know, know what the answer is. They don't like the answer. It's, it's, that's not what they want to do. They, if they, I'm just making this up. I propose if tomorrow the associate, um, they say, unfortunately, I'm just making this up. Suppose the associate tomorrow said, we're going to give $40 million a year for day school education in Baltimore. They could do it. You know and it would make a revolution. They're not interested in going in that direction for a variety of reasons. That's not, that's not what they want. First, we have to agree on what the goal is. If the goal is to turn Baltimore into a hotbed of Judaism and Yiddishkeit and these kinds of words which make people uncomfortable, uh, it's not too hard to, you know, to figure out how to do it. That's not where you wanted to go. In 1432, that is where they wanted to go, the, the guys in charge. Are there any other? Um, with respect to education, it's all depending on the severity of the environment in which you live. In other, in, other, in other words, if 
there is a choice. Are you a king, you are described completely, or you keep on with your belief. So you can go in Kiddush Hashem, you will still die. So it's, still a, it's still a loss. Now the converso, or the Maranos, now, if some of them converted just for the sake to survive and continue to live, there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. No, but that's, I, I, I'm not talking about that. What, I'm, what, what, I'm, what we're saying is like this. But why did the Jewish Jews, the ones who didn't convert, once this Holocaust was over, why did they say that the response they're going to produce is to pour all their money into Jewish education? It's, you can get it in English also. It's online. If you look at the Takanos of Olad Alin, you can read it yourself. Uh, and and, and I, that's the question I was raising. We're not talking over here whether the Murano's right or wrong or they make this change because you're right. You know, when somebody puts a gun to your head, who knows what somebody else does? I understand that. But, 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 but at the end of the day, what about the half of the Jews, the half of the population, who remain Jewish? How were they going to remain Jewish? This is the conclusion that they reached. You see what I'm saying? I will do one more and that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, enough time. One thing uh, I've noticed, uh, uh, I lived in Central America, is that the, uh, uh, the, the Catholics, whose names are a very, very Christian, Cristiani, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus Christos, uh, uh, Santa Maria, most of them are from uh, families and professors. I had a young man uh, who was working for me put his arm next to mine and say, uh, no, uh, somos los mismos uh, sangre, we are of the same blood. And I says, what do you mean? He says, I'm from a family of confessors. Well, it's not surprising. You know, that's the old Jewish joke in the 1920s. Three guys get on a, on a train in the Midwest somewhere. One guy says, my name is John Smith. The other Joe Joe. The third guy says, my name is, uh, you know, <laughs> Samuel Mc McClellan. He says, oh, I said, I, you know, you know they, well, we all know about that. I mean, you know, it's not surprising that they would take uh, names like that. But you're right. I mean, listen, th th this is true. Uh, when you start to think of this, and after 492, obviously there are going to be a lot of people of Spanish background who, if you want to trace it back, are Jewish. But, it, but, but they're not really Jewish anymore. I mean, you know, they might be, but you know, all they knew is to have some kind of a consciousness about it, uh, unless the unexpected it happens. Now, if Tony Singh was waiting very patiently, so I'll give you... I was going to ask you, uh, uh, how come there's a difference between the remnants of, uh, in Spain who were not converted, uh, they're able to continue the existence of Spain, whereas in the rest of uh, Europe, Germany, uh, after the Crusades, they basically Judaism had to leave. This is not true. The Crusades were over in the 1090s, and Jews remained in Germany until the 1400s. So it's, it's were the Crusades about this period? The only Crusade, contrary to popular belief, the only Crusade that directly, I, I know it's, it's a popular belief, the only Crusade that directly affected the Jews was the 1096. The other Crusades did not. In 1147, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor and the King of France said they make a big crusade, and everybody's uh, spirits were raised, and they already started talking about killing the Jews. You won't believe this. St. Bernard. You know, they named the dog after him. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no, I'm serious. You know, Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a famous Catholic saint, and wrote books against Judaism. He was no friend of the Jews. He went around all over France, and he preached right and left, and he said like this, the Jews are the scum of the earth. They rejected the Lord. They're bad news. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're like vermin, all the rest of it, but you're not allowed to kill them. You can't touch them. And the Jews said, like, I'll take that, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah, but but, but I'm, I'm serious. It's quite wrong. Nobody paid him off or something, I guess. He said, you know, you have to show them contempt and all the rest of it. No physical harm. And so nothing happened. Uh, and in Germany, the emperor, I mean, well, I don't want to go through all the crusades. But take it from me that the, the, the first one is the one we talk about. The others didn't, didn't happen over there. It's a, that's a complex question. Oh, chazom as they say. <laughs>